I don't normally start videos with the thing already taken apart, but I felt that was an extremely wise move in this instance because this particular thing contains a big, huge, high-voltage capacitor. It's rated 2,300 volts DC, 115 megafarads, and its purpose, its sole function, is literally to stop your heart. Because this device here is a retired Zoll AED Plus defibrillator, and it's very, very interesting indeed. What it does is quite staggering, and the history of defibrillators is also quite interesting. So this capacitor, it says Electronic Concepts Inc. 115 microfarad, 2,300 volts DC. Danger. The high voltage charge stored in this capacitor is lethal and may be retained for long periods. To avoid any danger of shock, the capacitor must be discharged before handling. So if you'd seen me earlier, even though this has been sitting here for a long time, and at this point I have to say this came from Norway, so it's this thing speaks, and it will speak in Norwegian. We'll try that later on. I've got batteries. Uh, it's been sitting here for a while. The person that sent it, thank you for sending it. Sorry for taking so long to actually get round to look at it. There were various complications. One of the biggest complications was the batteries it takes. Very standard batteries. Very difficult getting them sent to Isle of Man, particularly because the postal service at that time was just seizing everything that they thought was dangerous, like whiskey, for instance, and perfume, because they could burst into flames, apparently, and batteries, because they could also burst into flames. They were just seizing everything, cleaning chemicals a lot. They were just, it was a bad time for the Royal Mail. But anyway, it's been sitting here for a while, but it's now worth exploring. And there are newer versions of this, although uh, these seem to be still in use. And, uh, they're very interesting. They do a lot. And if you imagine the old films that you saw, the defibrillator, a big, huge machine in the surgeon's place, and they've got the big metal pads and they're sparking them off each other. That is not what they do with defibrillators. That was that might have been, that's movie defibrillators, but that might have been what it was like in the very early days. But uh, these days, it's a very sophisticated computerized piece of equipment that does not cost a lot. This whole unit costs... Brand new, about $1,000, pounds, euros, whatever your currency is, it's a grand. And that is absolutely amazing for something that can literally save your life in the event of your heart going into ventricular fibrillation. Let's talk about ventricular fibrillation. Your heart is a muscle with lots of multiple sections. That is a problem. See if your heart had just been one muscle. It would have been absolutely fine because when you get an electric shock, if your heart is only partially affected by that. The muscles that all beat together and sync and sort of give it almost like a twisting screwing effect, they, uh, if you get a partial shock, they, they can go out of sync. Some of them can be affected, some of them can't. And when that happens, your heart can lose sync. And for some reason, it's not really easy for it to get back into sync. The purpose of this unit is to detect that. And to do that, it does an ECG on you. It analyzes your heartbeat in like the actual waveform of it, decides if it is recoverable in the first place. If it's flatlining, it's not recoverable. They, they wouldn't, that would also maybe indicate the probes aren't even, the pads weren't even on the body. But uh, it will monitor your heartbeat, decide the best time to actually fire the resynchronization pulse that basically just stalls your heart at that point in time by bumping current through it. And uh, then, because your body can then now recover the heartbeat, your heart will theoretically come back into sync, especially if people are giving it CPR. Uh, the CPR also owes its existence to the invention of these devices. But let's take a look. Uh, this is rambling all over the place. It doesn't really matter. When I was taking this out earlier on, I was doing super precautions. I ended up, one lead at a time, stick a one mega ohm resistor in and then holding the inch lead cable stick the other in just to make sure it was safe even though it's been out of action for quite some time that is as i mentioned at the beginning why i didn't try this out just in case it did decide to do a test and charge capacitor up a bit i don't really want that i don't want this capacitor charged i don't want my heart stopped in a random manner right at the moment thank you very much anyway let's start with the high voltage section We've got some high voltage circuits over here. We've got a multi-section uh, transformer. Let's zoom down that so you can see it. And this high voltage transformer has the multiple sections, so it's most likely the high voltage one. Right next to it is a UX FOB diode that then goes to the positive connection of the capacitor. The negative connection is over here. Then we've got a 
divider chain on the negative of resistors, these ones are connected diagonally across. I wonder if this is so it can control the output power. Other components we've got, uh, we have uh, presumably trigger transformers here. Uh, we've got a current sense transformer. Trigger transformers here, I just thought I'd uh, just check I was still in shot there. Let's take the exposure off and brighten this up a little bit. Trigger transformers here, presumably, a uh, uh, current sense transformer, a couple of IGBTs, a stack of thyristors, which makes sense for the DC supply, more thyristors, more thyristors, and then opto isolators. Now, there's five opto isolators. There are five resistors. Is this to control the amount of uh, energy discharge through your chest? Because if you stick the pads across a baby, you get special pads just for wee babies, and it automatically tells it don't use the full charge because otherwise the baby would probably explode and shit its pants and stuff like that, and it would be very messy. So they don't do that. You also get a test pads that if you stick it on i don't know if it's a complete test unit demo unit for practice but it will just go through the motions but it won't actually do the high volt stuff for obvious reasons because that wouldn't be great during testing there is a relay the relay may be to disconnect the high voltage from the pads which would make sense because it may be that only energizes really to connect the high voltage circuitry for that high voltage pulse. Because at other times it is monitoring for the ECG signal and the ECG signal, the electrocardiogram, it's literally the same pads that are used and it is measuring a tiny, tiny little voltage signal, microvolts, if that, um, maybe even nano or picovolts. It's but it's got this amplification circuitry. But that's also coupled to the same pads that are banging out thousands of volts. I'm not quite sure how they do that. It's complex. There are uh, areas of circuitry with uh, a covering on them. That is presumably for circuitry that could be affected by moisture, condensation, stuff like that. So I'm guessing this is a main amplification circuitry. There is a very interesting little LCD display here. It's got an X. If I bring in the, the meter and I stick it to continuity and uh, mess around with that little thing, it looks like it's a memory retaining LCD display. Is this going to do anything? It displayed very briefly. You, you might have seen the little tick. It's not happy about me putting DC across an LCD display, which is not surprising. They normally want AC. But uh, um, you're not really seeing an awful lot. But suffice to say... That, uh, when I put this across, you you might have seen the little tick appear there. The tick means everything is good. The X is a sort of permanent memory, even if the batteries have gone flat, just to say the batteries have gone flat and it really desperately needs new batteries. Talking of which, talking of which, the Zoll unit, unlike pr other proprietary units, well, other units that use proprietary batteries, the Zoll unit uses 10 of these lithium uh, one, two, three cells. It's worth mentioning that uh, while 10 batteries, might, lithium batteries in particular, might sound a very expensive thing, it's nothing compared to the cost of the custom special batteries that the other units use. I am very fond of Zoll as a defibrillator. I, they, they have made it affordable. Not only are their batteries very easily and cheaply replaced with good quality ones, don't use cheap ones, but their pad system, here's their pad system. Let me zoom out for the pads. Their pad system is also extremely affordable. It comes with little pictures on it that show you where to put the pads. One uh, up in the top left of the chest. The little crosshair here is put in between your nips. Uh, and the other one then just lands where it lands. Uh, on the sort of lower right hand side of the chest. These pads have a much longer life in storage than many of the other brands of defibrillators, but they've also got this uh, pressure sensing thing that detects when you're giving it chest compressions that you're giving them strong enough, which is very, very good. It's very affordable. It's probably one of the most affordable defibrillators. You're not just uh, 
You're not just spending a grand on a defibrillator, you're spending a grand on a serviceable defibrillator that's going to be very affordable uh, to maintain the future. Right, at this point, I'm going to give you a bit of history of the defibrillator because originally the person that, that started working on it in earnest, so to speak, was a guy called William Cowenhoven. I don't even know if that's how to pronounce his name. Cowenhoven is how it's spelt. With a K, Cowenhoven. I don't know how it's, it's pronounced, but Cowenhoven sounds okay. But the guy was an electrical engineer with an interest in biomedical stuff. And he uh, he was approached by one of the utility companies because it was the during the electrification of America. And they found that a lot of the line workers were dying due to ventricular fibrillation because... A lot of the work was done with the power on and still is. Typically, on an average year, 20 to 30 American utility workers in the electrical industry, line workers, they die. That's, there's a lot of death still. And now a lot of the utility trucks in America do have defibrillators in them. But for a while, the utility companies are saying, great news, we've got a defibrillator. We're going to put it in our office for the manager in case they have a heart attack owing to obesity uh, instead of actually putting it in the trucks for the line workers where they actually belonged, which I thought was just a bit unpleasant. But anyway, hopefully they've grown up since and realised that providing their line workers who work on live electrical equipment all the time with defibrillators is what they were actually designed for in the first place. So anyway, William Cowenhoven originally developed the defibrillator and literally in the first, in the earliest days, they said, well, the electricity stopped it. Electricity can maybe start the heart. They got, the first ones were just a big, huge transformer sitting on a big trolley. And they wheeled it in and wooden sticks with metal plates at the end. And they used to literally open the chest and stick it either side the heart and give it a bang. And it's like, Jesus, it's like, oh, how they've come on since then. During the development, they were testing them. This is not going to go down well with the dog lovers. They were testing them in dogs. They were stopping the dogs' hearts and then trying to restart them. During those tests, they realised that when they were pushing the pads on from outside the chest, that the heart, uh, that the blood flow changed. And that's when they discovered CPR, how you could actually do external compressions to actually push blood through the body. Um, it's all a very interesting history. And from there, it just evolved gradually to these units that will literally log Every instant, they store the data. See this little uh, thing here? This is the infrared port in this unit. These days, I'd guess, they'd probably have USB ports or, or memory slots. But uh, certainly the one that... Uh, the information that came with this said, if you have an instant, let us know you had an instant. Uh, and if you send us the data, we'll send you a new set of pads and batteries for your unit just to keep it fresh and because you use a new set of pads each time. I thought that was very, very good. But that's what the manufacturers do. They want the data back so they can see the success rate of uh, and how well their software performed. It gives a complete analysis because these are fairly sophisticated. Right, tell you what, I'm going to stick it back in its box now and I'm going to stick batteries in and it will speak Norwegian. That's going to be odd because I think this is a single language unit. The new units, they speak multiple languages that you can select from the console in the front by fancy button combinations. But this one is probably going to speak Norwegian. So I'll put it back together and then we can try it out and see what happens. One moment, please. In the midst of putting it back together, I've put the frame in that supports the speaker and the capacitor. The capacitor is connected to its terminals. And I'm noting how the case has a plastic diaphragm here for the speaker. I don't know if you can see that. I'll tilt it up until the light shines across it. You can see the light shine across the diaphragm there. It's got a diaphragm for waterproofing. It's got this foam pad to retain the capacitor in position. And it's got these foam pads that apply pressure to all the bigger components, like this cluster of IGBTs and the transformers just to support them and keep, you know, everything tight and snug in operation. It really is designed for weather resilience to a degree and also use in vehicles where there's a lot of vibration. That is interesting to note. I shall continue putting it back together. One moment, please. 
It is back together with as many screws as I'm willing to put in. Something quite interesting is that it tells you what batteries you can use. It says you can use Duracell, Sanyo and Varta, but it says do not use Panasonic or Rayovac. Now, is that because they've got some, they, maybe they don't make a good connection, or is it because they've got higher impedance than other cells? The ones I'm using are Energizer, which it doesn't mention. Anyway, they're what I've got. Let's start sticking cells in. So the negative goes there, positive goes there. And I'll stick them in. Hopefully these will make a good contact. This is the joy of this, that you can use standard cells. Hopefully these ones are real as well. I think they came from eBay, just because uh, it was very difficult getting batteries. Electromobile Voxen. Oh. Installer batterier. Have you just installed new batteries, I think it's saying? Yes, I've just installed new batteries. These batteries are new. Is that it? I don't know. It's, it's not speaking my language. Uh, Ebdi in Norway will probably know exactly what it said. Let's turn it over and uh, do the thing. So the first thing it's saying is that, uh, first of all, you check if someone who's unconscious say, are you okay, just in case they're asleep or something. And then before carrying out... Uh, CPR and stuff like that, you call for assistance before you even start because you're not going to be able to do it once you've started. Then you open this up. And inside of the pads, they're usually in a nice sealed packet, but these ones have been used for testing by the previous users. And uh, you press this button to start it. It's a... Uh, okay... Okay. Now, interesting to note, when you take the cover off, you can actually place this under their shoulders. Okay, now it's telling me to put the electrodes on. And at this point in time, I would be placing electrodes. I'm not going to stick these myself for obvious reasons. I'm the only person here if anything goes horribly wrong. But once you put the electrodes on, it would start analysing what was happening. And it would uh, initially it might tell you to apply CPR. Uh, but when it's actually analysing, it doesn't want you touching the body. It doesn't want you giving CPR while it's... Uh, I'm just going to turn this off, actually, at the moment. Where's that? Right, okay, it's off. Uh, it doesn't want you disturbing the body because it is looking for a very, very fine... It's doing an ECG, and that is a tiny, tiny signal. So uh, once it's running, it, it's doing that ECG, it's analysing what's left of the heartbeat. If it sees a perfectly working heartbeat, then it won't do anything. It won't apply a shock. But if it sees that there is a problem with the heartbeat that is recoverable, recoverable um, it will then do that thing. It will say, please stand back. And when you're ready, it will say, press the button. And uh, it will actually fire a resynchronization pulse that theoretically brings the heart back into sync. Then it tells you to start giving it like the chest compressions and it will count them and it will also tell you if you're not pressing the thing hard enough by the this pressure sensor and then a couple of breaths of air just to keep the air moving in although these days they reckon that the chest pressing the chest actually moves the air itself it can actually replace having to give the breath of life as such and then it does that in a sort of like it it will administer a certain number of shocks let's do one thing let's test i'll turn it on again it's going to speak again I'm going to press this button. Ring for help. Okay, now is this going to No, it's just repeating the... In the circuit, not sure. Anyway, yes. Anyway, I'll turn it back off again. 
uh, that is what it does. And by putting different electrodes into this connector, if you put the baby electrodes in, it's a lower shock. You can put the test electrodes in, it'll uh, just emulate the, and go through the sort of test sequence, I think, with these. I don't know if it's a dedicated test unit. I think I mentioned that earlier. These, these are tight fit. Anyway, yeah, tight fit. Uh, anything else worth mentioning? Yeah. When you apply these electrodes in the first place, you've got things like scissors for getting clothing off. You've got a disposable prep razor. If someone's got a particularly hairy chest, you do want to take it. And here it is. It's uh, got little bristly bits. And then it basically it just shaves. Oh, that is quite. Yes, that will definitely shave. That will definitely shave the hair off the chest. And you've got your alcohol pads uh, for degreasing the chest just to get a good connection. Personal antimicrobial wipe. And you've got gloves and paper tissue and stuff like that. It's almost like an MRE, a military, military ration. The pads, these ones have been used. That's no great deal. They're quite moist. Uh, but these have this conductive gel and then the metal electrodes behind them. Hmm. No smell. I thought I got a swift of smell, but there is no smell. And as I say, the... the oh, I'll tell you what, let's go into this. You know, this is a... This is a retired set of electrodes. Tell you what, I'm just going to clear this area and we'll take a look inside this and see what they use as the pressure sensor. One moment, please. I'm not sure what to make of this. It's got some active circuitry on it, probably for telling the unit what pads are connected. And it's got this little metal enclosure. Let me bring this up and I'll focus on it and you can see it. And I'll zoom down. See a little metal closure there. I'm not sure that is. Is that a barometric pressure sensor? I don't see anything obviously a strain gauge. I was really expecting a spring-loaded switch. That's very, very strange. How peculiar. It does make sense because it is sealed round. Maybe it's literally looking to measure the deflection of this case as you squeeze, as you apply the chest compressions onto it. It's literally measuring air pressure changes in this because that would uh, allow, because it is a lot of pressure, it is, uh, you have to literally put a lot of weight onto the point you could potentially break people's ribs while you're applying proper CPR. I wonder if that's what that is. Uh, I'm trying to read the numbers on it. It says, 25870, 311, I'm not really sure. I'll let you judge, if you can see that. I'm not really sure what that says. It's very vague. It's kind of laser etched into metal, and it's not very clear. But anyway, the uh, the synopsis of the whole video is defibrillators are incredibly advanced devices. Um, they're not what the image that they used to be in the movies. They're very easy to use. I've had defibrillator training. It didn't take very long. Literally, it talks you through the whole process in English or whatever your language is. And uh, we'll even tell you with this little circuit board if you're applying enough pressure for the chest compressions. And its purpose is to simply, if it detects that you are effectively in a state of ventricular fibrillation, it will bring your heart into a controlled known state, stopped, uh, so that it can resync naturally, which is what your body does. It's worth mentioning that the legal industry did try and get their finger into the pie, unfortunately, and uh, tried to sue some people for using defibrillators. And uh, in the court cases surrounding that, it was pointed out that the defibrillator will only operate when you are technically speaking dead uh, because your heart's in that ventricular fibrillation state. Uh, so you can't kill someone with a defibrillator. You can only kind of effectively save them. Uh, so what we take away from that is that if it's a lawyer who is in a state of ventricular defibrillation, you may or may not wish to actually use it on them to avoid any litigation. But there we go. Defibrillators, an essential device, literally a part of a standard first aid kit these days and super affordable. Very, very impressive pieces of equipment. And I, without any sponsorship, throw my weight behind Zon because I consider them one of the most functional and affordable defibrillators available.